This is Christopher Cernike hosting episode 4 of season 4 of the Current Topics in Science podcast. This podcast will address breaking scientific news in light of the origins debate and host interviews with scientists. This podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Today on Current Topics in Science, we have the honor of hosting Frank Sherwin. Frank was in the Navy and received Christ while he was in Vietnam in 1971. And after he served, Frank went on to get a BA degree in biology from Wester State College and an MA degree in zoology from the University of Northern Colorado. Frank's speciality is parasitology, and he studied under and wrote papers with Gerald D. Schmidt one of the greatest American parasitologists. These papers were published in the Journal of Parasitology, and in fact, Frank discovered a new species of parasite, the nematode of the family Acuaridae, and he's currently a member of the American Society of Parasitologists and the Helminolithical Society of Washington. Frank taught human physiology and anatomy, medical microbiology, parasitology, General Biology 1 and 2, and Cell Biology for nine years at Pensacola Christian College. And Frank was the winner of the 2004 San Diego Christian Writers Guild Award for Excellence in Educational Writing. Frank now contributes his scientific expertise to a variety of ICR publications on creation science and is one of ICR's most sought-after speakers. Besides the Ocean Book, he's also the author of The Guide to Animals, co-author of The Fossil Record, Unearthing Natural History of Life, and author of The Human Body, An Intelligent Design. He's also a contributor to The Guide to Creation Basics and Creation Basics and Beyond. So as mentioned, Frank has studied zoology, and so he's going to be looking at the work of another zoologist, namely Richard Dawkins, in our interview together this afternoon. And now, without further ado, good afternoon, Frank. How was your day, and how are you doing? Great, Christopher. I appreciate, once again, uh, joining you on your program. Always a pleasure to have you on, Frank. And since this is Current Topics in Science, we're going to quickly look at this week's current topic. As mentioned in the intro, we're going to be looking at the work of Professor Richard Dawkins. Professor Dawkins is an evolutionary biologist and a best-selling author. He was a professor at Oxford University, and he is a critic of both the Bible and the creation origins model. He's recently released his new book called Flights of Fancy, Defying Gravity by Design and Evolution. An article from the New Statesman says, Dawkins' new book, Flights of Fancy, which is out for the Christian's market and is aimed at over the twelves, eludes the evolution of birds and planes in a manner that brings to mind faint echoes of Leonardo da Vinci's winged contraptions. Dawkins is afraid of heights and will creep towards a cliff edge on his hands and knees, but he's not afraid of plane crashes. He dreams of being able to fly, and also, incidentally, of getting lost in a large mansion housed with many interconnected rooms. He's not convinced, as the biophysicist Francis Crick was, that dreams are the mind's way of clearing out images that it no longer needs. I don't think science is a very convincing explanation for why we dream at all, Dawkins says. But Frank, what do you think about this new book, Flights of Fancy? Is Richard Dawkins correct to state that flight is an evolved capability? Well, I don't at all. As a matter of fact, when we first find birds in the fossil record, not surprisingly, they're 100% birds. To give you an example, Archaeopteryx uh, was found in some limestone shale. And since that time in Europe, they've been finding other uh, Archaeopteryx fossils as well. Now, Archaeopteryx had wings, it had feathers, and it flew. It was 100% bird. It also had a structure called the wishbone. In zoology, we call it a furcula, where the powerful flight muscles attach to. And so birds have always been birds. Now, evolutionists maintain that birds evolved from a theropod dinosaur. 
Now they can say that if they want to, and that's simply theoretical. It's just an idea that they have put forth and there's nothing wrong with that. But we look at a typical theropod dinosaur like T-Rex and we see those tiny little front arms there. And it's hard to imagine, even in a very fertile imagination, that these tiny little arms can evolve into the powerful wings that birds require in order to fly. And so that's another a significant problem for evolution, but there's two theories as to the origin of flight in birds. One is the ground up theory, and the other is from the uh, branches down theory. So in other words, from the ground up, evolution to say that this proto bird, a half theropod dinosaur, a half bird, whatever this bizarre creature must have looked like, and by the way, there are no fossils that would document this, uh, that this theropod would be running along the ground on its powerful hind legs, flapping uh, its front arms. And it just happened that it would be just the right type of conditions that would cause a low pressure surface area on the top of the proto wing and cause this thing to take off. But again, it's so theoretical and nobody can really figure out what this creature looked like. The second is from the top down from branches and that this creature must have glided. So that's another group of evolutionists who think gliders evolved into powered flight. But once again, there are problems with that. The most significant is what I just mentioned, the lack of fossil evidence. Thank you so much for taking the time to address that, Frank. It's interesting hearing all of those different explanations. And it sounds like as you mentioned, the fertile imagination, Professor Dawkins also has this very imaginative interest in flight. And while it was apparent that both you and Dawkins, you guys have very different outlooks on zoology and life. I know both of you have expressed a love of and an interest for science. But before we continue to look at Dawkins's work, I'd love to hear more about your own. What was it that made you interested in zoology, in science, and what is one area of your research that you are most proud to have accomplished? Well, Christopher, I have to kind of give uh, the kind of the negative aspect before I get into the positive, and that is when I was in high school a long, long time ago, I got a D in high school biology. I got a 68%. And I remember thinking that's one area I wouldn't go into. But then when I was in the Navy during the Vietnam War off the coast of North Vietnam, I got saved through the Ministry of the Navigators. Maybe you've heard of the Navigators. And so when I got saved, then it's the Lord kind of gave me this impression to study the biological sciences, of which I simply didn't have before. And so I began to study biology. I finished my commitment in the Navy, my four-year enlistment, and went to, as you mentioned in the uh, bio, the introduction, uh, went to Western State College, got my degree in biology, and then the rest, as they say, is history. So I really do enjoy teaching the varieties of biology, but also my field of parasites, that is invertebrate zoology or parasitology, and discovering a new species of parasite. And so we find um, that parasites have always been parasites, uh, but in the past, when God cursed the earth after our original parents sinned, uh, that was the corruption of the creation, and then God cursed the creation. We believe that's where parasites made their appearance. And so parasites might have been free living creatures prior to the fall of Adam and Eve, and then took on a parasitic existence. Certainly that would explain the origin of parasites not to demean or belittle the evolutionists, but they don't have really any idea as to the origin of parasites. And I appreciate their intellectual honesty and in that they make that admission, but the bottom line is they don't know where parasites came from. I think we have a pretty good model in regard to the origin of parasites that they were, as we say in zoology, free living. They, didn't, they weren't affected affecting other animals or people, and then after the curse, then they took on this parasitic existence. That's incredible, Frank, and once again, thank you very much for your service. I know my brother and I and my family deeply appreciate that, and I'm very grateful you shared all those experiences with us. Your research is really awesome, and with that, we're going to return to Professor Dawkins's work. We find that he has been researching and publishing about the evolutionary theory for decades. The Encyclopedia Britannica records that 
In 1976, he published his first book, The Selfish Gene, in which he tried to rectify what he maintained was a widespread misunderstanding of Darwinism. Dawkins argues that natural selection takes place at the genetic rather than the species or the individual level, as was often assumed. Frank, what do you think of the thesis of the selfish gene? Do you believe that it accurately reflects the scientific data? Well, I don't. And there's been a lot of scientific investigation, research, and discoveries that have been made since the publication of Dawkins' infamous 1976 book. He described how that he thought life on Earth was characterized by the selfish gene, as he calls it, competing. And that's a key word, Christopher, competing for propagation within the genomes of a myriad of creatures. However, ICR has been following the news, the science news specifically, and my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian Thomas, wrote an article very, very interesting in regard to this idea of the selfish gene. He, it's called the transposon behavior negates selfish gene theory, and this is on icr.org. Now, of course, what is a transposon? That's what we call a jumping gene or a DNA element that can insert at random into a plasmid, a plasmid being a loop of DNA. And so what Dr. Thomas has done is to write a very revealing article, and there are other articles on the ICR website. He said that contrary to Dawkins' theory of selfish genes, transposons or these mobile genetic elements, the jumping genes, are not trying to take over their host's genomes as to what Dawkins suggested. Dr. Thomas asks a very good question. He said, if the transposon is selfishly competing with the genome in order to survive and reproduce as Dawkins described, then why does the transposon interact with its host genome in a cooperative manner? Remember I said earlier, competing for propagation within the genomes? Now we're finding out it's doing not the opposite, but pretty close, that the host genome is in, working in a cooperative manner that fits like a hand in a glove? That's an excellent scientific question. So we would say, Christopher, that genes certainly do not act selfishly. In fact, most genes are plant genes that serve largely a selfless role. So these jumping genes don't exhibit signs of selfishness. <laughs> they don't struggle against one another. And even more recently, uh, in 2018, an evolutionist by the name of Philip Ball wrote a piece in what's called Chemistry World. Now, Christopher, that's available online, Chemistry World, where Philip Ball notes the ongoing challenges to the validity of Dawkins' selfish gene metaphor, and is simply a metaphor, this idea. And by the way, the article also highlights uh, other inconsistencies with evolutionary theory. Frank, thank you so much for going over the thesis of the selfish gene. That book was published nearly five decades ago, and since then, Professor Dawkins has sought to further expand his case for the evolutionary theory. For instance, on Richard Dawkins' Foundation YouTube channel, there's a video called Richard Dawkins Answers Reddit Questions. In this video, he was asked the question, out of all the evidence used to support the theory of evolution, what would you say is the strongest, most irrefutable, single piece of evidence in support of the theory? Frank, I'd actually like to pose that question to you as well. How would you answer that question? Do you believe that the strongest evidence for evolution holds its own weight in the scientific arena, if you will? Well, I don't. And there's a lot of suppositions that go into what we call macro evolutionary theory. And I, as a zoologist, like to make the emphasis between macro evolution, the large change, and micro evolution, which we could also say is just minor variation within the created kind uh, that God talks about in Genesis chapter one. And so I would say that probably the evolutionists would, would maintain that every animal has a parent. And that's it. They say every animal has a parent and you go back the alleged, the supposed millions and millions of years of parentage and offspring, as you were. 
And somehow this is evidence for evolution. So that's what I've heard in the past. Oh, so thank you for answering the question. That was an interesting answer. And it's amazing both you and Professor Dawkins have extensive knowledge in the same field of science, but you guys come to such radically different conclusions. And for this question, we're actually now going to look at Dawkins' answer to the question about the strongest evidence for the evolutionary theory. This is a very extensive quote. However, the full quote is available in the links in the description. However, I did my best to quote what I felt was the crux of Professor Dawkins' argument, which goes as follows. Dawkins said, To me, perhaps the most compelling evidence is comparative evidence for modern animals, particularly biochemical comparative evidence, genetic molecular evidence. If you take any set of animals and identify the same gene in different animals, and you can really do that because the letters of the DNA code, they're the same in all animals, and you can really find a gene which is the same, say, in all mammals. For example, there's a gene called FOXP2, which is a couple of thousand letters long, and most of the letters are the same in any mammal, so you know it's the same gene. And then you go through and literally count the number of genes of the number of letters that are different. So in the case of FOXP2, if you count the number of letters that are different between humans and chimpanzees, it's only about nine. If you count the number of letters that's different in humans and mice, it's, I don't know, 30 or something like that. Actually, frogs have them as well, and you'll find a couple of hundred that are different. So you can take any pair of animals you like. Kangaroo and lion, horse and cat, human and rat, any pair of animals you like, and count the number of differences in the letters of a particular gene, and you plot it out, and you find that it forms a perfectly branching hierarchy. It's a tree. And what else could that tree be but a family tree? This is overwhelmingly strong evidence. The only way you could get out of saying that this proves evolution is true is by saying that the intelligent designer, God, deliberately set out to lie to us, deliberately set out to deceive us. So Frank, we've just heard the strongest evidence for the evolutionary theory, according to Professor Dawkins. So can you tell us what are your thoughts on this argument? Well, first of all, I really resent that Dr. Dawkins would say that sort of thing about our creator God. He loves us very, very much, and he is not the author of confusion. He's author of love, and he's just, and he's coming back in power and glory. And so long as there's breath in Dr. Dawkins' lungs, he has an ability to repent. But let's go ahead and look at his uh, so-called evidence for, for evolution. He's using molecular systematics, that is, counting the nucleotide numbers of a particular uh, protein, in this case, FOXP2 protein. And sure enough, you could get something like Dawkins was talking about. However, Carl Woese, or should I say the late Carl Woese, W-O-E-S-E, who was a pioneer in evolutionary molecular systematics, said the following, and it's in regard to what Dawkins was talking about your quote just now. He said phylogenetic incongruities, phylogenetic means the evolutionary process, incongruities can be seen everywhere in the universal tree. Now, Woese is talking about the same tree that Dawkins is talking about. Continuing on, from its root to the major branchings within and among the various taxa to the makeup of the primary groupings themselves. End quote. So we find these incongruities. But also, microbiologist Michael Svanen tried to create a tree showing evolutionary relationships using 2,000 genes from diverse group of animals. So this is significantly more than what Dawkins was talking about. This individual, Savannah, I guess I'm pronouncing his name correctly, used 2,000 genes. Here was his conclusion. He failed. The problem was that different genes told contradictory evolutionary stories. The genes were sending mixed signals. Now look at this, roughly 50% of its genes genes have one evolutionary history and 50% another. Absolutely between the two there. One says one, 
and one says the other. The data were so difficult to resolve into a tree that Savannah lamented, and I'm quoting him again, we've just annihilated the tree of life. The same tree of life that Dawkins is appealing to with the FOXP2 gene. Many other papers in the technical literature recognize similar problems. For example, in a, 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 a journal that my colleagues and I read is the Trends in Ecology and Evolution, 2009, quote, a major challenge for incorporating such large amounts of data into inference of species trees is that conflicting genealogical histories often exist in different genes throughout the genome. And so we're finding more and more problems using just the genes for various kinds of proteins like the FOXP2 protein that Dawkins was all excited about. In 2009, the journal New Scientist, I shouldn't call it journal, it's really a magazine, New Scientist, but it is an overtly evolutionary atheistic publication. I've been reading New Scientist for years. They published a cover story in 2009 entitled, get this, why Darwin was wrong about the tree of life. I thought that was an interesting title and I salute New Scientist Magazine for being intellectually honest and admitting that. And it says here, the problems began in the early 1990s when it became possible to sequence actual bacterial and archaeal genes than, uh, rather than just RNA. Everybody expected these DNA sequences to confirm the RNA tree, and sometimes they did, but crucially, sometimes they did not. And then New Scientist also put it this way, for a long time, the holy grail was to build a tree of life, but today the project lies in tatters, torn to pieces by an onslaught of negative evidence. End quote. Now, there's something else I want to emphasize, and that is if evolution is true, and if you and I came from some pre goo, you know, pre lifelike goo, and the unknown, unobserved common ancestor one half billion years ago in what's called the pre Cambrian, if we came from a, a primal sludge, it may have been a photosynthetic cell, probably not. It may be a bacterial cell. The evolutionists don't know. All they know is that that's what, where our evolutionary ancestry lies. And that through the half billion years of slow and gradual change, we produced palm trees and elephants and blue whales and people all from this primal cell. Now, Christopher, if that's true, we should be able to document that in the fossil record. The fossils should be able to show that, and they don't. That's why uh, many evolutionists turn to the uh, bacterial genome. And uh, that, well, they, they turn to, uh, for example, uh, the, the proteins that, that uh, Dawkins was talking about, varieties of different kinds of proteins, counting the amino acid sequence and trying to put an evolutionary spin on it. But what the molecules say and what the fossils say are two different things. They simply don't line up and they should if evolution is true. Yeah, I was just thinking, I remember when I heard Dawkins say that, Professor Dawkins say that, I remember I tried to think of my own answers and I was like, well, one of the things I know he said is that this would indicate that God has deceived us, that he's lied to us. But my first thought was that, well, God as the common designer, not the common ancestry, he would make creatures that are similar to one another because like we all function in the same world. And so if one of us required completely radically different living circumstances and every single one required a different program, then you couldn't have them all in one place in the earth. And so that's a design optimization. It's like you make technology like ports that are compatible with different plugins and things. But I really love that you're saying you went through all of the technical literature and you brought out these inconsistencies. Yeah, uh, it's true. You know, they would say a common ancestor, but we should keep in mind it's always an unobserved, undocumented uh, um, common ancestor that conveniently ex uh, existed in the very, very distant past. Evolutionists call it deep evolutionary past. Well, that's uh, very convenient for the evolutionist. 
we would make the prediction as creation scientists that we would never be able to identify what that as a real common ancestor was. For example, sometimes people say, <laughs> if, if we came from monkeys and why do we still have monkeys today? And it shows that they don't understand what evolutionists are saying. Evolutionists are saying several million years ago, you had a common ancestor of the monkeys and the apes and the various kinds of gorillas and all that. And you had, it was the same common ancestor for people. And at a critical point, millions of years ago, there was a, they branched off. And one branch went to the uh, apes and monkeys and chimpanzees, which are supposedly our closest common ancestor, and people on the other end. So you have today all of those types of hominins that I mentioned, and you have people. And so that's what evolution is saying. But the point I bring that up, Christopher, is that they'll never identify what that common ancestor millions of years ago was. And so we would make that scientific prediction. Well, Frank, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on the accuracy of Dawkins' argument. Indeed, our God is not a deceiver. He is the designer. And speaking of design, our next question is actually going to look at a Twitter post from Professor Dawkins where he was commenting on an animation that he saw. The animation was called Molecular Visualizations of DNA, and he commented on it saying, Animations like this, especially part two, knock me sideways with wonder at the miniaturized intricacy of the data processing machinery in the living cell, and with admiration for the science that has worked it all out. So Frank, when you look at the miniaturized intricacy of the data processing machinery in the living cell, what conclusions do you draw? Well, as a creation scientist, one who is, is born again, as John chapter three says, I look at this, uh, for example, the typical single cell in reverence and awe, and I spontaneously say, how great thou art, because I can see the hand of the creator, or should I say the thumbprint of the creator in the incredible sophistication and detail of the single cell. And so we would look at that and give glory to the creator, not the creation. Uh, and this is what Paul talks about in Romans chapter one. Then in these days, the evolutionary, the secularist will give glory to the creation and not the creator. May it never be for us at ICR or for anybody that names the name of Christ. And so we would simply say as a kind of a simplistic statement, design means a designer, creation means a creator. And certainly that is true when we see this. And even the evolutionists kind of get caught up in it and start talking about design and start talking about the awesome complexity. And the creationist is in the background saying, exactly, exactly. But unfortunately, evolutionists turns at the critical point before they hit the bullseye of the creator and go off into giving a purely uh, I would say almost a sacrilegious explanation for everything that they see there. Think about it, in the tiny field, the tiny arena of the cell, how much sophisticated and, and detail there is, all of those biochemical processes must work together. At the same time, if we use a telescope and look out into the great expanse of the universe, we, we are reminded what the psalmist says in Psalm 19, 1, that the heavens declare the glory of God. And so it's enough to put us, as we say in Texas, on shouting ground. Frank, we've actually now arrived at our final question. And honestly, it was um, it was actually kind of a heartfelt experience for me to learn more about Professor Dawkins in preparation for this interview. Um, like as I listened to his work and read some of his books, uh, I never knew, for example, that he was afraid of heights. But I do hope that someday, as you said at the beginning, he's going to realize that God's not asking him to come up to the heights of heaven on his own. For his son Jesus has come down from heaven, is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, and has given himself on the cross to free us from sin and death. Um, in his discussion with Professor John Lennox, Dawkins said that a serious case could be made for a deistic God. Frank, if Dawkins were here right now, what would you like to tell him about the serious case for Christ? the Savior who sacrificed himself for him, for you, for me, and for everyone listening? 
Well, Christopher, you know, as I read the Word of God, the 66 books of the Bible, we understand that there's about four centuries that separate the Old Testament from the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, we find that there are specific prophecies and predictions about a real blood and flesh individual that would exist in New Testament times that is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. Very, very specific prophecies that couldn't be uh, you know, anticipated by anyone. For example, where the Lord Jesus would be born was prophesied. And uh, the prophecies that he fulfilled when his, uh, his time on the cross. And so I would appeal to Richard Dawkins just to look at this, this record of biblical prophecies and fulfillment and consider that the Bible is more than just a storybook that he maintains. Evolutionists, atheists ignore these biblical prophecies and fulfillments. But that's not enough, because when we look at the life of Jesus Christ, we find, Christopher, that he said the most profound things that have ever been sent, said by an individual. We see that he did the most incredible things that have ever been done by an individual, giving the blind the ability to see immediately. Remember, the Gospel of Mark is one of the shortest Gospels, but also it is the Gospel of the right now, as I call it. The key word in Mark is immediately. There wasn't any time involved. Immediately, water became wine and so forth. And so this is what's so amazing about the Lord Jesus Christ, what he said and what he did. And then ultimately, I would appeal to Dr. Dawkins to consider the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, and that we have all of these world leaders, and I'm not here to denigrate any of them, all the world religious leaders, excuse me, all the, the founders of the major world religions, and they're all dead. But there's only one who is victorious over the grave. And the Lord Jesus physically rose from the dead after the third day to ultimately prove once and for all, and by prove, I mean through what we call legal historical evidence, not scientifically, and I understand that, but through legal historical evidence that Jesus Christ rose physically from the dead. And I would ask the atheists, the agnostics who are listening, discuss Tell me the legal historical evidence against the physical resurrection of Jesus. I've never had an atheist or agnostic take me up on that challenge. Frank, thank you so much for your time. It was an absolute joy. And to our listeners, thank you for taking the time to learn with us on current topics in science, where scientific discoveries are examined in light of the origins issue. You can find Frank's biographical information, his video lectures, and articles in the description below. Please share and subscribe to the Current Topics in Science podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves.